If you've been investing in the stock market for the past few months, you probably had fun with stocks like Tesla, Shopify, and Zoom. But you also probably realized that the momentum isn't as reliable as it used to be last year. In this video, I'll be talking about the four probable scenarios I'm seeing for the NASDAQ index. So if you're holding a lot of growth stocks and tech stocks, make sure to watch this video so that you understand what the probable scenarios are. Before we get started, don't forget to like this video and smash the like button for more content. And as always, this is not financial advice. This is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Without further ado, let's get started. So before I talk about the four probable scenarios of the NASDAQ index and tech stocks, I want to briefly go over a summary of exactly how the NASDAQ index outperformed after COVID. To begin with, untacked theme stocks were on the rise, providing opportunities for stocks like Zoom Communications and Shopify to skyrocket. Secondly, there was a trickle-down effect that occurred as a result of quantitative easing. When the Fed buys treasury bonds to provide liquidity in the market, a trickle-down effect takes place in the order of large-cap stocks, small-cap stocks, and emerging country stocks. They initiate a QE to help mid- to low-cap stocks, but the big tech stocks that already had stable fundamentals benefited even more. Thirdly, with automation and the normalization of working from home, the trends related to the fourth industrial revolution have been accelerated. Lastly, with low interest rates, growth stocks were optimistically valued. In case you don't know what this means, here's how to simply understand it. Normally, tech stocks and growth stocks don't generate tremendous amount of cash, but have high valuations because people expect these companies to generate a lot of money in the future. In other words, growth stocks valuations are based on their future value as opposed to the present value and the discount rate plays a key role in determining the future value. So if someone asks you whether you want your $100 today or $100 a year from now, you'd obviously say that you want it today. If the interest rate is 10%, the $100 you received next year should be worth $91 now. But if the interest rate is at 1%, the $100 you receive next year would currently be worth $99. So during times when the interest rates are low, the discount rate is also low as well. So growth stocks are expected to generate a lot of money in the future, but since the interest rate is so low, a low discount rate is also applied accordingly, and the current value of these companies are valued highly which justifies the stock price as being high. With people taking the COVID vaccine, it seems as though the first point regarding untaxed stocks is now invalid. Quantitative easing is not as dramatic as when COVID first began, which invalidates the second point as well. Most importantly, we saw interest rates on 10-year U.S. Treasury bonds go up, which was bad news for growth stocks, and as a result, the Nasdaq started correcting severely around Friday. So let's take a look at the charts. We peaked at the all-time high level of 14,173 points with significant support levels at 12,074 points, uh, 10,782 points, and 9,833 points, which was at the peak before the COVID drop. The green line on the chart is the 20-day moving average, the orange one represents the 60 moving average, and the sky blue represents the 100 moving average. We can see that the NASDAQ index first dropped through the 20 moving average, bouncing on the 60 moving average, and then passing through to bounce once again on the 100 moving average. Additionally, we can add upward trend lines to form channels which help us identify significant support and resistance zones. So the lines you see here, these parallel lines are the ones that form parallel channels. And by looking at these lines, we can identify significant support and resistance zones. Now, in order for you to make money in the market, you need to think like one of the big players. Suppose that you're a hedge fund manager with a few billion dollars in assets under management. You're big enough to wield influence over the market. That means that the market drops when you sell and it pops when you buy. So with this condition in mind, let's think of the best way possible that you can achieve your goal. For instance, as I've explained in my other video, which you can check out by clicking the top right corner, there has been a shift from tech and growth stocks to value stocks and cyclical stocks. Now, 
You as a fund manager want to sell your tech and growth stock positions in order to move on to value stocks. So you need to think of how retail investors and the market will react to you selling these positions. So going back to the chart, you scooped up a lot of tech stocks and growth stocks around March and April of 2020 with the Fed on your back. And this did indeed turn out to be a good decision as we can see. But there has been a paradigm change in that the interest rate for bonds have skyrocketed. If we look at the 10-year treasury yield, it has started skyrocketing since around the 21st of January. So your goal is to rotate sectors from tech stocks to value stocks. So when exactly will the market provide this opportunity? If we go back in time, the market has been on an overall uptrend since the financial crisis. Every time we had a market correction, regardless of the severity of it, it was seen as an opportunity to buy the dip. The thought process of how these retail investors think are wired based on the price action of the market over the past 12 years. A dip means buy more. Especially after the COVID drop, a lot more new retail investors joined the market in fears of missing out. So as a hedge fund manager having to sell a lot of tech stocks, what you would have to do is induce this FOMO sentiment from retail investors. You can't just sell all your holdings. You need to sell just enough so that the NASDAQ index touches a significant support level, which then causes a lot of retail investors to buy back into the market thinking that it was just a dip and that the market market is going to continue moving up endlessly. Then when the NASDAQ index bounces, you get rid of your position until it reaches another support level and induces FOMO. And you continue doing this until you get rid of all your holdings at the best price possible. So going back to the chart around the 21st of February, I was thinking about what we'd see for the stock market and I was referring to technical analysis to see whether I'd look to buy stocks at this level or sell them. And honestly, with the price looking to bounce on support, it looks like a great opportunity to buy. But then I thought there had to be a catch because it looked too picture perfect. But then I remembered that the paradigm had changed. The 10 year US Treasury bond rate skyrocketed and that changed the entire game. So it was only logical that the support wouldn't hold. One of the characteristics of markets that have big institutional players that are capable of manipulating the market to an extent is that there are clear stop hunts. In case you don't know what stop hunts are, here's an explanation. Normally, when the price drops, it bounces right on support or it goes right through the support and continues to fall further. Stop hunts are when big boys who are capable of moving the market know where the support is and intentionally bring prices down below that level only to have it bounce back up. Of course, retail investors would panic sell as the support breaks, only to see institutional investors scoop up their bags and keep moving upwards. This is more evident when we look at the 4-hour chart. So if we look at the 4-hour chart, we can see that the index closes slightly below the support line, only to move back up. In this case, we can also see that the candle has wicked below the support line, and in this region as well, which would have caused FOMO to retail investors, inducing them to buy when it bounces back up around this region. So going back to today's video topic, what exactly am I seeing for the four probable cases of the market, specifically the NASDAQ index? The first case is one in which we bounce off a significant support level and continue to rally upwards. The second case is a case in which we see a imminent correction with a stop hunt below 12,000 points only to see the index bounce back up and continue to all-time high levels. The third case is where we'd see a clear trend reversal as the NASDAQ breaks down significant support levels, marking the end of a bullish cycle for tech stocks and growth stocks. Lastly, a scenario in which all of the above are wrong and the unknown unknown occurs. If I had to assign probabilities to each scenario, since we should always make decisions based on probabilities, I'd say that the first case has a 40% probability as well as the second case. I can see the probability of a complete end for tech stocks is 15% and an unknown unknown case with a probability of 5%. If we see the Fed mentioning even just the probability of expanding QE, operation twist, or YCC, yield curve control, 
we would see the rally continue upwards. But without any confirmations, simply betting on new highs is a very risky position to take. Make sure you're properly hedged and that you hold enough cash just in case things go south. If you like this video, make sure to drop a like. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.